Hello, matriculants. We are focusing on the literature essay still, but what I'm going to do today is um, focus more on the um, last two November papers. I'm looking at the November 2018 paper and the um, November 2019 paper and the topics that came in those papers. In lesson seven, we focused on the format of the literature essay. But I thought maybe what we would do is we'd look a little bit more closely at the actual topic. So I'm just going to share my screen with you once again. Right. So we're looking at the literature essay topic from the November 2018 paper and the November 2019 paper. One of the things I find learners um, sometimes struggle with is that um, word count 400 to 450 words and then learners you know either can't write enough um or they can't think of ideas they are now forced to maybe do the literature essay for life of pi and then they can't think of examples from the text so again very important that we actually do study our work again plot characters themes we spoke about this in a previous lesson it is very important that you actually go over those things in preparation for a literature essay. So this is lesson eight of the um, of on the Life of Pi series. We're talking about the literature essay, but we're looking specifically at the um, 2018 paper and 2019 paper. Right in the November 2018 paper, the Life of Pi essay question was: the novel Life of Pi suggests that despite offering con contradictory approaches to life, reason and faith can coexist. I've underlined the theme of reason and faith coexisting or being compatible. You know, my, your teacher might have spoken about it differently. I always say to my learners, sometimes we speak about it one way in class and then an examiner might use different wording, but essentially the themes are all the same. So whether we speak about faith or whether we speak about belief in God, it's the same thing, reason, your teacher might have spoken about science, science and um, belief in God being compatible or coexisting. It is the same topic. So just use your, um, you know, your discretion and, and make sure that you understand that, you know, this is actually a major theme. Um, if you've gone through your notes, you would have come across this idea of reason and faith. You might not have found it in the same wording, but it would have been sort of mentioned in the themes on Life of Pi. Right, again, we are asked to critically discuss the extent to which you agree with the above statement. So when I'm looking at this formatting of the, the essay question, it starts with a statement and then you are asked to critically discuss. So I've underlined the instruction words once again because that is important and we need to pay attention to it. I just say to my learners, whenever you see the word critically, it means just give an opinion, make sure that an opinion is indicated there. Of course, in a literature essay, you can't say, I think that. You would rather restate because you can't use, firstly, you can't use the personal pronoun. We spoke about this before. Um, so you would rather restate it as, you know, this essay argues that. So nice and it sounds very really formal. It is exactly the way the literature essay should sound, in fact. So then you give an opinion. And then you also have to give a discussion. So you are asked to have, make sure that you have an opinion because you are going to be asked to what extent do you agree? So you, do you completely agree? Do you partly agree? Do you disagree completely? You know, you need to give your uh, opinion. So that's the word critically. And then of course the word discuss, which is a broad term. If I look at the word, uh, you know, like discuss, um, in terms of definition, it normally means give both sides of, of the story of the argument and it also means bring evidence um you know to the fore again you are asked your response should take the form of a well-constructed essay when we looked at the dbe 2018 paper it was asking exactly the same thing a well-constructed essay so i'm taking that to mean that the examiner wants you to write an essay according to the format that you must use Oops, the light is shining on my face here Right, so your response should take the form of a well-constructed essay. Again, you are told 400 to 450 words. That's the, the um, word count. And if you run short of time, you know, and you um, have, are struggling to finish the paper, then just remember it's about two to two and a half pages. 
um, abnormal writing. Why I say that is because some people write really tiny, so they could get it maybe in less, um, you know, but some people write really big on the other hand, and they might need three, four pages, and then only will they have their 400 to 450 words. But for an average handwriting, which most of us do have, it's two to two and a half pages. Okay, I move on. So just breaking down the essay question a little bit. Just move my my cameras a little bit. I don't know why this light is shining on me like this. Right. So the essay question, the statement. Um, right. Despite offering contradictory approaches to life, reason and faith can coexist. That's our theme right there. The instruction words are critically discussed, um, and then we are asked the extent to which you agree. We must comment on that. And then we know that we must write a well-structured essay, looking at my typing errors. Oh, this teacher can't type, <laughs> can't spell when she types. And then lastly, the word count. So those are things we must pay attention to when we're reading through the question. So read through the question thoroughly. Can I also suggest that you either use a highlighter or a pen or pencil and underline the key components of the question. So one of the key features of the question is obviously the theme, reason and faith coexisting. Then I've been asked to critically discuss, and then I must actually discuss to what extent I agree with that statement. My essay must be well constructed. I move on. So just a note on instruction words again. I think I will look a little uh, at this a little bit more in detail when we do contextual questions because the instruction words seem to vary uh, a lot more than they do if I'm looking at this, um, you know paper, it is in terms of the instruction words, it's exactly the same wording as the same instruction words as the DBE 2018 paper, the supplementary paper and the November 2018 paper and I think the November 2019 paper as well are asking you to critically discuss an aspect of the novel. Right. So instruction words indicate how you should respond to the exam question. So the word critically once again, an opinion is required. It does not necessarily mean to criticize. I keep saying that, but you know, sometimes learners forget. They see the word critical, and you know, it, and they define it very narrowly as, oh, I need to criticize. That's not necessarily the case. It simply means you must give it a critique or an analysis. So it indicates that a detailed evaluation or a review is required. Maybe I should go back to my laser pointer and just point out my keywords. So we need to do an evaluation or we need to do maybe a review. When we're thinking critically, we're thinking about aspects of this topic that, you know, we agree with aspects of the topic that we might not agree with. So that is when I'm thinking critically. I'm really looking at an evaluation of a text when I'm looking at it critically. So candidates, that's you, might agree to a greater or a lesser degree with the statement, but you are unlikely with this topic to uh, disagree wholeheartedly. You know, reason and faith is a very prominent theme in Life of Pi. And so I can't see how you can make an argument where you're saying you completely disagree with, with, um, with this being a theme. It is a major theme. So we're not going to be able to completely disagree. I don't think you can even write an essay in which you completely disagree and then can extract examples you know, from the novel because there are so many examples of reason and faith coexisting in the novel. The word discuss normally means, I put it in brackets, both sides of an argument. You know, normally in a literature essay, you would take a stance and whatever you're stating in your thesis, that would be the stance that you take. And so you are providing evidence, evidence sorry, for whatever argument you make. So, you know, and so it's your opinion. So basically it's your opinion and then you're providing evidence to indicate why your opinion should be valid or should be considered as, as um, you know, as correct. So again, because literature is as opinion based, it, it, you know, you can get a wide range of opinions from learners. Um, like I said, it is very difficult with this essay topic to actually say, nope, reason and faith cannot coexist when clearly Pi is indicating that it does. Move on. Right, just this well-constructed essay was the focus of our last lesson, lesson seven. A well-constructed essay 
must include the following things because your examiner is going to be looking out for the following things as they're marking. Remember, the examiner is sitting with a rubric. There are two criteria on the rubric. One is content the other is content it's content including the format so you need to make sure that you have the correct content and formatting of your essay so when we speak about a well-constructed essay it means make sure that you nail that format so the first thing i need to see when i'm marking an essay is i need to see an essay title what is your essay title try and keep it short don't Write down that entire topic that is on the question paper, the statement and the um, instruction. Don't write that down. Rather, look at what you're being asked to do in this essay and then maybe just tailor your own little title to your essay. So maybe you can just take forward. It doesn't matter if you, you lift it off the um, statement, for example. So you could say the reason, um, you know, and and, um, faith are compatible and that's fine that would be your essay topic keep it short an essay, a title isn't normally longer than about six words anyway and then i've underlined it here where's my laser pointer there we go i've underlined essay title because that's exactly what you do when you write an essay title underline it alternatively put it in quotation marks right you must have an introduction again these are the things examiners are looking for did you write an introduction and was there a thesis statement. Be very careful that your thesis statement must express an opinion. I remind you, I take you back to lesson seven, that a good technique to use is the taco method, where we're talking about the text, we mention the genre, we mention the author, we mention the um, key ideas, in this case being um, reason and faith coexisting, and we give an outline of what we're going to write about. And because we have to give an outline in the thesis statement, it makes sense that the introduction will be done last. So we don't actually do a, um, a literature essay chronologically. We keep the introduction for last once we know what we're going to write about in the body. So this method we're going to use, we're going to make sure that we provide the context. Again, your essay is going to start with in the novel Life of Pi by Anne Mortel, and then you tailor it to whatever the topic is. In this case, um, reason and faith are compatible. Right. Your body paragraphs, that's important for a well-constructed essay. There must be clear divisions in your, in your writing, no solid writing, meaning you can't have just one solid piece of writing that has no divisions in it clearly you need to have an introduction and then your body paragraphs must be divided into your topic sentences or your main ideas that are going to be the basis of your argument and then again we have a plan of action so make sure that you know this plan of action when you're writing literature essays to either use the texas method or the peel method peel method so one of those methods that you were maybe taught with you know taught by your teacher use one of those because they do work well. Bear that in mind as you are writing your paragraphs that I need to put down my topic sentence. I need to explain. I need to give an example. I need to analyze and I need to sum up. Also, I'm going to use linking words. Okay. The conclusion, again, this is the last paragraph. And again, you ask yourself, so what is the examiner looking for? What must I do in my conclusion? Firstly, I must not include new information in my conclusion. So that's going to be a fault in terms of my formatting of my essay. I must only summarize what I've already written. So I can take into consideration when I do a conclusion, what have I put in my introduction, what have I put in my body paragraphs, and now I just do a quick summary of those two things. That is the function of the conclusion. So we can use the latte method there, meaning to conclude, we want to be able to link um we want to be able to you know sort of look at the author's intention we want to go back to the theme and we want to end off well and essentially what we're going to do in the conclusion which you know which we should do is sum up the main points of the essay and then lastly part of a well-constructed essay because you know you also have a language criterion in the rubric so it's not just content and formatting it is also language so there's you know everywhere that you are writing in an, an english paper whether it's paper two as this one is or it is paper three or paper one 
your English teacher is always going to be checking your, your language. So be careful with your language. And then also, you know, an essay, a must, a literature essay must be written in present tense. Unlike your creative writing essay where you perhaps have a choice, you can write in past tense or present tense if you want. You can, um, you know, you can, I don't know, do foreshadow, foreshadowing, you can play with time. You know, your literature essay will do none of those things. It's not creative. So you're not going to use that whole host of creative writing techniques. You're going to focus more on the formatting. And essentially, I, it's an argument which you present literally. Pardon. You don't actually use like writing techniques, like similes and metaphors and trying to show off your writing techniques. Please don't use a rhetorical question in your literature essay unless your intention is to answer the rhetorical question yourself. But try to avoid the rhetorical question. Keep those techniques for creative writing. So you must be in mind always because I find this is a common uh, mistake that my learners make. They forget when they're sitting in that exam that one of the essential things about a literature essay is that it is written in present tense. Right. Points to plot on your tree or your brace map. If you're going to do a tree diagram or a brace map for your planning of your literature essay is to look at, you know, number one, to almost think of like, you know, what, what is it that I'm being expected to discuss in my essay? And then to make a little bit of sense of it, you know. In the past, for example, um, I'm thinking of an essay that was, uh, you know, cropped up in the paper where they asked, you know, is Hamlet a wimp? And then the learners had to give their opinion. But a good place to start is not to say, yes, he is a wimp or no, he is not a wimp. Clearly, the word wimp is um, uh, informal. English. And so the, a be, the best place to start is actually to start with definition. Give your definition of the, the words or the terms that might be a good place to start. So when we think of reason, it is the power to think I've just highlighted some of those key words in a definition of reason. So what does it mean when I'm being, you know, when I'm being reasonable? It means I can think clearly. I can understand. So when I'm using my reason, I'm using my judgment. I'm being logical. So it helps one to consider the effects before taking any kind of action. You, be, you use your reason, right? Faith, on the other hand, is almost sort of the opposite of that. When we have faith, we have belief in a higher power. It isn't logical. It is belief-based or faith-based. Um, but we believe, we commit to that belief. Although these might appear to be contradictory concepts like reason, I'm thinking, I'm logical, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm looking for empirical evidence to make a deduction. I use my powers of observation with regard to reason. With faith, I can't use my powers of observation. I just have to believe, for example, that God exists. So these two concepts seem to be um, contradictory concepts. They seem to not be compatible, but we want to argue, in fact, that they can coexist. So my last point here is that although these might appear to be contradictory concepts, the novel will suggest that they can coexist. Reason and faith can coexist. Right. I move on. Just in terms of planning, I find that the major headache for learners is that they have the topic they um, might recognize the theme, the reason, and, um, and faith. So they might recognize the theme, but they struggle with coming up with ideas. So I thought this lesson, we would focus simply on essay topics and look at planning. How would I plan to um, write this essay? What ideas would I put into such an essay? So if I were asked, to speak about reason and faith in an essay and the fact that they can be compatible or coexist, what are some of the ideas I could bring to my planning? I think sometimes that is where we're lacking and the reason why we only write maybe 200 or 300 words and then we get stuck is because we're not quite sure what ideas to include and what to include in our planning. So that is going to be the focus of the lesson today is what to include. So given that we have this topic on reason and faith coexisting, we can then look at these things to include in our planning. So. We started off with definition, clarifying to the examiner, this is what my understanding is of reason, this is what my understanding is of faith, and therefore they appear incompatible, but the novel is going to 
propagate the idea that they actually can coexist. Right, so that's where we started in terms of our planning. Secondly, in terms of planning, we look back to the author's note, and then we know that the element of faith is introduced very early on in this novel. It is inter introduced in this really, uh, um, you know, strange author's note, which is in fact part of the novel, unlike other novels, unlike other stories where the author writes a note um, and the author speaks to us and then clearly differentiates between the, the novel and the author's note. This one, in fact, is blurring the lines between the author, which is factual, and then the fictitious author, who is fictional. Right. But the fictitious author, maybe, um, you know, and um, Francis Adarabasami having this conversation, we know that this, the topic of faith is introduced when the narrator or the fictitious author is told that Pi's story will make you believe in God. So again, if we're looking for important quotations from the novel, I would say this is right up there with the most important. The fact that the writer starts with this, um, you know, discussion in the author's note means that faith is going to be a very important component of the novel. Right. Again, in terms of our planning, I've just kept the, um, you know, I've just kept the, the topic in mind. I put it there every time I'm looking at this, like a new slide. Let's just remember that we're looking at the topic of reason and faith coexisting. So what can we write down as evidence of reason and faith coexisting? So here's my point number three, in terms of my planning, there's Pi's love for logic, uh, for the logic of science, which is nurtured by his teacher, his biology teacher, Mr. Uh, Mr. Satish Kumar, as well as through his observation of animal behavior at his father's zoo. And so because I'm wanting to plan for my essay, the other thing that becomes really important, we saw it with my slide previous, the previous slide, is I want to be able to use quotations where I can. Again, like I said to you last time, you don't need to specifically know quotations, but you need to be able to paraphrase and extract evidence from the text. So there is Pi's love for science, which is nurtured by his science teacher, his favorite teacher at high school, Mr. Satish Kumar, the biology teacher. And also he is somebody who is quite observant and insightful, and he watches the animal behavior on his father's zoo. And of course, to a certain extent, Santosh is also, you know, sort of, teaching his, his son, both his sons, actually, you know, to grow, how to grow up in the zoo, paying attention to the animals posing a danger to them. And so Pi is learning quite a lot about, you know, animal behavior, logical deduction, etc. Pi will speak about his teacher and say, he's one of those teachers who came into my dark head and lit a match. So the fact that Pi is um, inspired by his biology teacher, essentially, you know, biology is a subject in the sciences, suggests to us that Pi is going to, part, part, partly Pi is interested in, in the sciences. Um, he will study zoology at university, we know this, he tells us this in the first few lines of part one of his narration, um, and is inspired by his teacher, Mr. Kumar. Right. Pi has a very interesting take on atheists because he finds out in chapter seven that his teacher is an atheist, which shocks him. And he, I think it's one of the first conversations that he has with an atheist. Pi does say, you know, it's the first time he heard somebody speak the way his biology teacher speaks, who says he doesn't believe in, in faith. But Pi will say to us that, you know, even though his teacher is an atheist, he still admires him because he says, uh, you know, atheists are our brothers and sisters of a different faith. So I like this word because, yeah, the idea that, you know, Mr. Kumar lit a spark by his love for science, but Pai still sees him as a man of faith. So that's an odd view of things, but Pai does take this view. So essentially, you know, Pai is saying he might not have faith in the religion or faith in God, but he has faith in science. So Mr. Kumar inspires Pai because he is a man of science and he looks for rational explanations. And he, in fact, says to Pai, reason is my, um, you know, reason is his faith or religion, if you want. And so what we find in discussing this theme of the coexistence of um, reason and faith, we find 
Mr. Kumar, who is an atheist, but also a scientist, and being able to coexist with Pi. Pi looks up to him, admires him, treats him as a role model, and, you know, we know that Pi is a religious, he is a, a, a spiritual boy. Maybe we, we I, I wouldn't want to use the word religious. I did type that out, but maybe I'm thinking now I should have typed out the word spiritual. He is a person of faith, Pi, because, you know, this word is a bit contentious because, um, the religious leaders don't think that he's religious. They think that he's pious, but not religious because he doesn't follow any one religion. But they, but they do think that he's pious or a person of faith. Right. So one of the ways that I prove in this essay that, um, you know, reason can coexist with, um, with faith is that we have Mr. Kumar, who is a person of reason, and pi and they have this bond that they form or establish and pi being a person of faith right but pi actually will also you know embody the idea of reason and faith so he will have all both those qualities inside of him right you will also say to us the two mr kumars actually inspired him to study the subjects that he did at university he did biology and religious studies as a result of the two Mr. Kumars. So again, Pi embodies the idea that reason and faith can coexist. Right. Again, in terms of my planning, what other information can I bring to this discussion? Pi says that, you know, um, Mr. Kumar says to him that reason is my prophet. And so again, that's an interesting and short sentence that we can remember. But if you if you can't paraphrase it, you know, Mr. Kumar speaks about the reason being like, uh, um, you know, like something religious, something that he follows, something that he believes in. Atheists are also capable of having faith, therefore. So that is Pai's comment about atheists are, uh, you know, there's a kinship with, with atheists that he feels that they are his brothers and sisters, although they have a different faith. So their faith lies in science. And for that reason, Pai then says, Atheists are also people of faith, and he sees that they have things in common. Him being spiritual and them being people of faith because they believe in science rather than in the belief of God. Right. So there is Mr. Kumar, the biology teacher, saying to Pi, the reason is my prophet. Um, and then Pi says, you know, every word that they, and he refers to atheists, that they speak, speaks of faith. So Pi's, you know, uh, again, he's... His idea that atheists who believe in science, they believe in something. That's the idea, that they believe in something and they have faith in something. Pi is able to admire that. Um, something I want to point out, especially if you are going to use a quotation, you will see that I'm using both the curly brackets and the square brackets. I'm using the square brackets to explain to the examiner what I mean when I'm quoting the word they, which can be really vague in the context, because my quotation, when I'm using it in my literature essay, it must make sense. It must be part of the paragraph. It must fit into the paragraph. And if the uh, word that is used in the novel is the word they, I want to make it clear. So that is just for the sake of clarity. I'm using the square brackets to indicate what Pi means when he uses the word they, that he is referring to atheists. Right. So again, this idea that, you know, Pi sees that they, they have, um, you know, something in common, namely faith. And therefore, the scientist, the atheist, and the person of faith, they are compatible. They both have faith. Right. I'm moving on. Other things in terms of my planning for why reason and faith are, can coexist. Pi embraces three religions to which he is exposed at, at a young age. By the age of 15, he is already a Hindu, a Christian. He becomes a, 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 a Hindu at birth, basically, is the way he describes it, with his aunt Tirohini taking him to the temple at a very young age. Um, he becomes a Christian at the age of 14, and he becomes a Muslim at the age of 15. So he is exposed to these religions very early on in his life. 
and he recognizes that they all reflect the common element of love for God. So, you know, this is a very unusual faith for Pi to have, the polytheism, the, the belief in three religions. And in fact, what will happen is that the discussion that he has with us about the three wise men in chapter 23, I put that word wise in inverted commas because perhaps Pi is obviously referencing, um, you know, that's a, a religious illusion, a biblical illusion to the three wise men. But maybe also a little bit ironic because they, they start to argue amongst uh, amongst themselves about what Pi should be, whether he should be Hindu or should be Christian or should be uh, Muslim. They want him to make the choice. And Pi will say that they almost comes to blows over it. So here are these people of faith, and but their behavior is so unlike people who, who are meant to be spiritual leaders. So to what extent are they actually wise? Um, you know, to be putting such demands on this young boy. Right. So they, they want him to choose only one religion. That's the way most of us, you know, go about religion is that we choose one and that is the one that we are faithful to. But Pi has done things really differently. Pi will then say to them in this very, very awkward interaction where they meet the three, um, you know, the three. Uh, um, leaders, uh, spiritual leaders. They meet, meet the Hindu pandit, they meet the, the priest, and they meet the imam. One Sunday afternoon while Pai and his mom and dad are taking a stroll on the uh, seaside esplanade. You know, these three religious leaders happen to converge on Pai, and then it, the situation is really awkward because they all think that Pai is, you know, a follower of their own faith. And so they will actually demand in that moment that Pi will, must make a choice. He must choose only one religion. Pi's response to this is, Babu Gandhi said, all religions are true. I just want to love God. Now, Pi says this and the, 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 the wise men feel really awkward because they can't exactly argue with Pi. Isn't the religion about loving God anyway? Whether you're Hindu, Christian or Muslim, we might not entirely agree with Pi, but it makes sense that he wants the religions that he practices it will, you know, allow him to love God. With that, they can't argue. And so they, again, you know, they just sort of walk away. So when I'm looking at this topic of reason and faith coexisting, I'm thinking to myself that, you know, the fact that Pai mentions um, Mahatma Gandhi obviously means that Pai has read up about Mahatma Gandhi and his philosophy with regard to religion. So I'm looking at that as this rational study of Gandhi's work. So that's Pai using his reason to understand that religion, you know, um, religion, uh, all religions are true. So, you know, this lovely combination with Pai being, um, you know, intelligent, using his reason and arguing that he's read up on Mahatma Gandhi whose philosophy, and if I'm using the word philosophy, clearly there's the ability to reason. Your philosophy is your way of thinking about the world. And so it is from Gandhi's philosophy, which is, which appears to be reason, or, or, or you know, the fact that he did the, the, the philosophy of Gandhi, uh, suggests that Pai is a person who's gone to do his research. So the research was obviously on faith, and so he can use that when he um, justifies the fact that he has three religions. All religions are true because there's one goal ultimately and that is to love God. So he's used a very rational study of Gandhi's philosophy. So he's used reason in order to justify that he wants to love God in order to justify his faith. So again, we can see there that the reason and faith are compatible. I'll move on. Um, the next point in terms of our planning his passion for science and religion is, um, you know, encouraged by the, the, the two mystical Mars. We've spoken about this already earlier on. We mentioned this. Despite their different perspectives, one is a scientist, the other one is a deeply religious Muslim. They are able to reach consensus. That's the word that I underline because it's going to show us how reason and how faith can coexist. So we know that the first Mr. Kumar, the biology teacher, is only first because we met him first in the story. So that was chapter seven. The first Mr. Kumar is a man of science. 
and the Mr. Kumar, the baker, is a man of religion. And yet in chapter 31, when they both end up at the zoo and they both appreciating the grand zebra and appreciating the beauty of the zebra, you know, that is where they, 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 they both agree that the zebra is a beautiful creature. So they can actually reach consensus on the appreciation of the zebra. This incident that Pai describes to us suggests that, again, the two ideas of reason and, re and, and religion or reason and faith, that they can actually coexist. So there is the common joy that stems from appreciating the beauty of the Grand Zebra by Mr. Kumar, the science teacher, who will, you know, appreciate the Grand Zebra for being a scientific miracle. And then Mr. Kumar, the, the Muslim baker, who will appreciate the Grand Zebra for being a miracle of God. So, you know, again, they, they both admiring the beauty of the Grand Zebra, one from a scientific point of view and the other from a religious point of view, but they both stand there and they admire the Grand Zebra's beauty. Pi will end off this particular chapter by saying they all stood there, we all stood and we looked at the zebra enjoying the sight. So this idea that, you know, both science and um, uh, faith can actually be compatible is encapsulated in chapter one, the, um, the meeting of the two Mr. Kumars. Right. Some other things we can use in terms of our planning here. Pai says, you know, some agnostics, or he suggests some agnostics believe that reason and faith cannot coexist and that everything should have a logical explanation. Pai doesn't like this. You know, the one type of person that Pai actually is very judgmental about is the agnostic or the person who lives in doubt of whether God exists or not. So this is what Pi has to say about them. He says they choose doubt as a philosophy of life. So they go around, you know, doubting whether God exists. And he says, you know, how can you use doubt, which makes you immobile? Because, you know, you know, where, where are you going with doubt? You can't go anywhere with your doubt. You don't go further with doubt you don't get further with doubt as a it's immobility as a means of transportation that's what he says at the end of chapter seven using this lovely sort of paradoxical statement and again putting judgment his judgment on the atheist that he he doesn't the agnostic sorry so the atheist is his brother of another and sister of another faith but the agnostic is a person that pi just doesn't admire because pi says you know what he goes through a life in doubt no faith whatsoever, faith in nothing. At least the atheist has faith in science. The person of faith has faith in God, but the agnostic has faith in nothing. Um, and then this interesting chapter on, um, you know, in chapter 22, very short chapter, so you should go and look it up. In fact, I would suggest all the chapters where we are taking our quotations from, perhaps go through those again if you have time because there are important chapters and we're finding that we can use quite a bit of evidence from these particular chapters. Right, the short chapter in which Pai discusses the um, agnostic on his deathbed and the atheist on his deathbed. And then he discusses the thing that we probably all know about, the common knowledge of the light, at the, you know, at the end of the tunnel. So as we die, we have this experience of the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, so that they see, that is something they see on their deathbed. Pi is convinced that the atheist will then eventually see God. He will use his powers of observation. He will see God. He will say, my God, and this is how he will see the light. It will be divine light. He will witness God, and the atheist on his deathbed will take the leap of faith and believe in God. However, Pi condemns the agnostic as on his deathbed not seeing God's divine light. And what the atheist, or at least, sorry, getting so confused, atheist and agnostic. And what the agnostic will do is he will try to explain, you know, that light that he sees approaching him on his deathbed, and he will not see it as the God's divine light, but he will see it simply in very literal terms and say to himself, well, I am dying. This is not divine light. This is simply failing oxygenation of the brain you know this light is coming from the fact that i am, am not getting any oxygen to my brain and so 
essentially the agnostic cannot make the leap of faith not even at the end of his life unlike the atheist who will find god and will find god's divine light so when we're looking at this theme of reason and faith being compatible Pi says this is not so according to agnostics. They use only their reason and their reason will tell them wrongly, according to Pi, that you know seeing the light at the end of the tunnel is just failing oxygenation of the brain. So they cannot make a leap of faith. And so for them, reason and faith cannot be compatible because they don't have faith. They have you know, lived in doubt and they will see things too literally. Right, I move on. Um, on the lifeboat, both reason and faith help Pi to survive. His faith allows him to maintain focus and hope he doesn't give in to despair. So he will pray to God, he will, um, you know, perform all these religious rituals, while his scientific knowledge and his ability to think logically will sustain him physically. So basically, Pi is being sustained mentally by his faith and spiritually by his faith, and he's being sustained physically by the, his knowledge of science. So again, that idea that the two are compatible in Pi on this lifeboat where he is struggling to survive. Right. Pi says to us, he makes this very, very firm decision that he will live. He says, I will put in all the hard work necessary. And I thought this was a really good quotation because the hard work will come down to Pi's knowledge, to Pi's ability to be rational, to Pi's ability to use his judgment. So the hard work on the lifeboat is whatever he can find on the lifeboat. And then maybe he needs to think out of the box about how to use it. Remember, Pi will, for example, take the, the turtle shells and those turtle shells, he will make bowls out of them. Um, you know, he will use them um, in multiple ways. He will, so he'll use it as a bowl. I mean, he could essentially, if he wanted to scoop water from that, he will use that as um, a dish in which you can cut up turtle meat or, or, or fish meat, etc. He will use that turtle um, shell as a, a canopy when his blankets start to break to, uh, to pieces because of the exposure to the, the elements. So, you know, Pi is thinking rationally. He's using his, um, you know, ability to make rational decisions and judgments about the things that he has around him. So that for me was this beautiful example of his hard work would come from his scientific knowledge um, of, and his powers of observation. Um, and his ability to make decisions. So that for me represented the scientific side of Pi. And then he adds, yes, as long as God is with me, I will, I will not, I, sorry, as long as God is with me, I will not die. Amen. So that one quotation was for me encapsulating this idea of Pi's reason and faith being absolutely compatible. So he will work hard on the lifeboat using his um, reason and he will also make sure that he holds on to his faith. He's also going to work hard at holding on to his faith in this life, but where he's been a daily text. So again, Pi speaks to us about his religious rituals. So we know that he is performing these rituals in the lifeboat. It gives his life purpose in this lifeboat. And we also know that he will have to adapt his religious rituals. For example, he speaks about solitary masses. So that's his religious rituals. But he's had to use his reason or his judgment to adapt. He cannot go to church. He doesn't have a priest there. So he's got to do these masses on his own. <coughs> Pardon? Right. He also speaks about his uh, acts of devotion to Allah without knowing where Mecca was. Um, he will perform his religious rituals, so, but he's also adapted it. So again, that's his reason coming in there. The other aspects that show us that, you know, Pai is a, a person of reason and sound judgment is in the way that he will train Richard Parker. <coughs> Pardon, frog in my throat. He will train Richard Parker with his knowledge of lion tamers, for example. He knows about flight distance, which he told us about in part one. 
which is the minimum distance that a, an animal will allow a, a, a stranger or another animal to come before it attacks or before it, you know, before it attacks. So clearly he's got to shorten that flight distance between himself and Richard Parker because they are on a lifeboat. It's a very confined space. Pi also knows about territory and the, the, uh, um, the, the fact that um, animals are very territorial. So he knows he needs to train Richard Parker to accept part of that lifeboat is the um, tiger's territory, but a part of that lifeboat must also become his territory because he cannot survive on the raft. It's going to, it does in fact, you know, it, 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 uh, it is set adrift by when there is a storm. So he has to get back on that lifeboat in order to survive. So he's got to get the tiger to accept that there is his territory on this lifeboat. So again, what we see here clearly is the um, coexistence of Pi's faith with his ability to be a person of reason and to use sound judgment. Right, point number nine in terms of planning Pi's reason makes him realize that he has to abandon his vegetarianism. You know, he's been a vegetarian all of his life until he gets onto that lifeboat. He can no longer be a vegetarian if he hopes to survive. So he needs to resort to killing in order so, to survive. So he um, knows this. He is able to reconcile himself to this by showing reverence for and by praying over his kill. So he needs to kill. Pi actually becomes quite proud of the fact that he becomes a, a hunter. So he speaks about his hunter's pride, his developing skills that he obviously didn't have before, um, that he also didn't know he was capable of. But when he kills his first fish, Pi will say to us, that to this day, he still prays over the fish. When Richard Parker kills the Frenchman, the blind Frenchman, Pi will say that I pray for his soul every day. When Pi witnesses the horror of the, um, the zebra being eaten alive by the hyena, he will say, I still pray for him. I never forget uh, to include, you know, the, the first fish he killed, the blind Frenchman and the zebra are always included in his prayers. So, you know, he kills to survive. He knows he must, he has to give up his vegetarianism. He needs to kill to survive. So that is the reason, the reason in Pi, the rational side of him. And then he prays over, you know, um, having to be a killer. So again, the compatibility of reason and faith. So, <clears throat> He's able to reconcile himself with this idea that he um, is becoming a killer and he will pray for what he is, for the, for, for the things that he has killed, people he has killed. Also rationalizes the need to distance himself from the savagery, savagery to which he descends. So he knows he has become a savage, he's also become a killer, but it is the evil that he is forced to commit in order to survive. The creation then of Richard Parker is alter ego enables him to cope with the horror of his actions. On first glimpse of Richard Parker under the tarpaulin, Pi speaks about his thing. Pi exclaims, God preserve me. So, you know, God is never far from Pi's mind. His instinctive cry is for God's protection when he sees Richard Parker emerging un from under the tarpaulin. Like, Pi will tell us how he prays over the, the horrors that he has either done or witnessed. So not a prayer goes by that I don't think of it. And again, my square brackets to indicate that it refers to the zebra, says Pi in chapter 45. Then he says to us, I never forget to include this fish, the uh, first fish that Pi kills in my prayers from chapter 61. And he says, I pray for the soul of the blind, blind Frenchman every day. So again, he's a reason because he had to kill in order to survive and then his faith, and he, he prays over the, the kills. Move on. In terms of planning, later at university in Canada, Pi's choice of you know, his subjects reflects his ability to find common ground in two seemingly very disparate sort of worldviews, science and faith, or science and religion. His choice of science as a career and his religious nature reflect his ability to reconcile reason and faith. So Pi will say to us in chapter one, 
academic study and the steady mindful practice of religion slowly brought me back to life. I should put quotation marks here. I'm just noticing my ears once again. <laughs> As I type these slides, you know, I've been a little bit negligent in not closing the inverted commas. But essentially when he says academic study, he speaks about academic study and he speaks about the mindful practice of religion. So he has three religions and he follows them and he puts them into practice. Um, and he says, it was that that brought me back to life. It made him his old self again. So these are the things he needed to feel whole again. So he did his academic studies. Again, we are reminded of, you know, this is sort of, he studied zoology, but he also studied religious studies. So the, the clear coexistence or compatibility for Pi of being an academic, but also of being religious, that the two will go together. Academics and religion, they represent respectively reason and faith. Right. And so he tells us that his studies were religious studies and zoology. And just the fact that he has studied these subjects indicate that to Pi they are compatible because he has chosen faith-based studies and is also chosen out of you know zoology which is in the science faculty so you know it suggests that again it is symbolic of the fact that reason and faith can coexist right furthermore the japanese officials do not believe you know the last um but that I want to talk about in terms of, is there more? I think that's it, yeah, okay. The last um, point that I want to make with regard to reason and faith, you know, the Japanese officials will tell Pai when, he's, when he tells him the first version of the story with the animals and he tells him about the algae island, you know, they will say that they don't believe it because it defies logic, right? <clears throat> but Pai will say, oh, you know, bananas, but bananas can float. So he's going to use a scientific explanation to prove that his story is um, valid, um, to prove that the first story, version of his story is true. He says, like, put the bananas in the water in the hospital ward, you will see that it will float. So he's trying to use scientific methods to prove to them why his story is realistic. Remember that the orangutan um, you know, floated on the um, of the net filled with bananas. So that's what he's using as evidence that his story is true. The orangutan couldn't swim, but could get to the lifeboat floating on the bananas and bananas could float. So he will use scientific explanation to try and prove his first version of the story. He maintains that at times one has to have faith and believe such as the belief in the existence of God without any empirical evidence. So basically the word empirical, empirical means simply data that you can collect and it becomes evidence. Right. So he will say to Mr. Okamoto and to Mr. Chiba, you know, God is hard to believe. What is your problem with hard to believe? He says, you find my story, my first story hard to believe. What is your problem with that? Isn't God also hard to believe? God is hard to believe. Ask any believer. You must have faith to believe in God. You're not going to see God. There is no empirical evidence to prove that God exists. You need to believe. So there shouldn't be a problem with hard to believe because we believe in God anyway. We make that leap of faith. Right. And then Pai says, so yes, um, I'm telling you a story about God and God is hard to believe. So he's bringing in his faith. And then he will say to these Japanese officials, and I applied my reason in that lifeboat at every moment. Believe me, I applied my reason. So he has brought into the discussion, God, you don't believe my story. You say it's hard to believe, but so is God. And then he has brought into this discussion with the Japanese official his reason. He said, I needed to use my reason in order to keep the tiger away. Right. And then he will end. So in, essentially, you know, his faith is compatible with his reason once again. And then he will end off saying to the officials, you know, one cannot be excessively, to be excessively reasonable. You know, you risk throwing out the universe. Then how can you appreciate the universe? The universe makes sense only to pie through his Hindu eyes. Everything he understands about the world. You know, he's seeing evidence of God in creation. 
in whatever God has created. They are the miracles of God's creation. So the universe makes sense to him through his Hindu eyes, through his Christian eyes, through his Muslim eyes. You know, he accepts that these creations are of God because they are so miraculous. So Pi is arguing that one cannot be excessively reasonable. The agnostic is excessively reasonable, looking for reasons to explain everything, even on their deathbed. But to be too reasonable is to be, um, you know, is to be unable then to see how everything ties in to the existence of God. So when, again, so when he says this to the, you know, one cannot be excessively reasonable, you know, excessively logical, excessively use your judgment, excessively use your powers of observation. There must be moments in your life when you can rely on your faith. So there is a reason and there is how one understands that the world is created by God and the world contains all of God's miracles. Understanding of the world comes from your faith in God. So again, Pi puts together um, reason and he says one mustn't be excessively reasonable because one must also have faith. And so you can't be one without the other. Because he says this is like throwing out the bath water. This is like doesn't make it doesn't make sense to live ex with just excessive reason. There is, you know, a place for your faith. You must have belief for the world to make sense. Otherwise, the world, you know, throwing out the bath water doesn't make sense to Pi. So again, in his mind, reason is absolutely compatible with faith. Just the last point that it's always found on the um, that is always found on the um, you know the memo when you're looking at the memorandum questions. This is my son is very sleepy. He should go to bed. Is that you know the memo always says, and this is to your benefit. In brackets, after points are mentioned that you could use for your uh, your essay that are relevant arguments, the memo will always mention that um, if you come with valid alternative responses, it is going to be credited or given. You know, you are going to be given marks for that. If you come with a mixed response or your plan includes a mixed response you will be credited as long as it is within the context of a discussion of reason versus faith. So again, when we're looking at this topic, we're going to say mostly the topic is proven that, mostly the topic is proven that, um, or at least, yeah, of reason and faith being compatible. It is proven in this novel. We found many examples to back up the um, the thesis, the opinion that reason and faith are compatible. However, you were also asked to discuss to what extent you agree with the topic. So there is room to actually disagree and to say, well, agnostics do not believe that reason and faith are compatible. They simply based it, base everything on, on the reason. And Pi dislikes them because they actually are not basing anything really, uh, uh, you know, on, on, they base nothing on faith, nothing. They have faith in nothing. They live their lives in doubt. So that suggests to an agnostic that the reason and faith are not compatible because they don't, you know, believe in anything. They have faith in nothing. So that is one sort of, area where you can disagree with the topic and therefore present a mixed response. So you don't completely agree that reason and faith are compatible because you brought in the discussion of the agnostics, which give you a mixed response. But that's all good because the question is saying to you, critically discuss the extent to which you agree with the topic and you have just indicated that you don't entirely agree. So these responses can also be credited with marks. Again, I certainly haven't mentioned all of the examples there are in this novel um, that indicate that um, reason and faith can be compatible. 
you might have you know other examples that you extract from the novel as long as they are valid they are um, going to be good examples to use in an essay on um, reason versus faith right and that's it i think i'm going to stop the lesson here and then carry on um, next lesson with uh, the 2019 um, literature essay so let me just stop sharing my slides right there we go matriculants so we looked at the 2018 literature essay topic on reason and faith being compatible we spoke about it as being one of the major themes again you can expect in a literature essay that um, examiners might ask you i mean it's reasonable <laughs> you know to assume that examiners might focus on the major themes of your novel and so you need to know them because they are coming up in exam questions all the time we looked at this idea of um, reason versus faith but there's also this idea of um, boundaries and survival and so you know there is a mesh of some of the major themes do not disadvantage yourself for the exams and not go over the themes you must you must know your themes as thoroughly as you possibly can and clearly in a literature essay you need to know examples because those examples are going to be the evidence that you put in the literature essay so again good luck with your studies happy studying prepare yourselves well do the best that you can <laughs>